This is the second in a series of eight lectures on the doctrine of Christ. And uh, here at this time we are continuing our study of the reasons, some of the reasons, the nine or ten, well, let's see, I have more than that, about 14 reasons here I see, for the incarnation of Christ. And uh, number six of these 14 reasons, to provide an example for believers. In 1 Peter 2, we're told that Christ has suffered, and then he has left an example for us that we should follow his steps, not in his steps. In other words, what would Jesus do and on a given occasion? Would Jesus smoke a cigarette? Well, no, he wouldn't, so I won't smoke a cigarette. Now, that type of reasoning is all right, but that's not what 1 Peter 2.21 says. It says that Christ has come to be an example for believers. Now, you see, the world misunderstands the incarnation. They think that Christ is an example for unbelievers. But no, he is not an example for unbelievers. He is a savior. He came to save unbelievers and make them believers. And then we are to study the life of Christ because he is our example. But we could not have had an example apart from the incarnation. Number seven, to provide the believer with a high priest. Apostle Paul says in chapter 3, the book of Hebrews, verse 1, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. And then he goes on and he discusses these uh, qualifications of a high priest. Uh, so our Lord came to be a high priest. We'll look at that a little more in a detailed way concerning his ministry as a high priest when we come to the offices of Christ as prophet, priest, and king. And then to destroy the works of the devil. Again, Hebrews chapter 2, vor verse 14 <clears throat> Uh, the Bible says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the nature of Abraham. All right, so here we have this reason to destroy the devil and his works. And number nine, to escape the historical curse, a twofold curse, uh, which made it mandatory for the virgin birth upon Adam's seed. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, the Apostle Paul here is speaking of the origin of sin in the universe and in the world. And in verse 12, he says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. But the incarnation escaped this curse upon Adam's seed. Jesus was not a member of Adam's race. He is known as the second Adam. There are actually two races on earth today, not a black race or a white race uh, or a Caucasian or an, uh, uh, and a white race, uh, not an oriental or an occidental race. But there are two races on earth today. There is the race in Christ and there is in Adam that race. And the Bible says, as in Adam shall all die, but as in Christ, all in Christ shall live and shall never perish. And so the incarnation then uh, severed that connection between Christ and Adam's seed. And then another historical curse was upon Jehoiakim's seed. Jehoiakim was one of the kings of Judah and God had pronounced judgment upon him. And so Jesus now escapes that judgment by being born of a virgin. Uh, the incarnation 
and the way was planned, escapes the curse upon Adam's seed and upon Jehoiakim's seed. And then he came, the Bible says, to heal the brokenhearted. Luke chapter 4, our Lord preaches a message in Galilee, and he uses as his text, I'm sorry, in Nazareth, in Galilee, I should say, the city of Nazareth in the province of, of Galilee. He uses as his text Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he goes on to say that he came to heal the brokenhearted, to set at liberty the bruised, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, to give life, and then abundant life. He said, I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. And number 14, he came to glorify the Father. In John chapter 13, this is the upper room situation here, and in chapter 13, verse 31, and I'm turning to that now, we read these words, Therefore, when he was gone out, Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. And in verse 13 of chapter 14, Jesus says in that same upper room message, And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So Jesus came not only to reveal the Father, but to be glorified by the Father and have the Father glorified by the Son. Now, We've looked at his pre-existence, his Old Testament ministry, uh, the virgin birth incarnation. What about some of the names for Jesus? I believe we've used this illustration before, but in his play, Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare, a great poet, once asked the question through the mouth of a young girl whose name was Juliet. The question is this, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any, any other name would smell as sweet. And thus to Juliet on that moonlit night, a name was totally irrelevant and unimportant, but not so concerning Bible names, which often give keen insight into the lives of those individuals who bear the titles or the name. And this is especially true concerning Christ. In fact, a wealth of information concerning his person and work can be obtained from uh, studying the names and titles ascribed to him. And we have a number here for your consideration. We'll go through these uh, very rapidly. He's called the Adam, the last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15. He's called the Advocate, and that literally means my defense attorney, one who comes to my aid. He's called the Amen, the so be it. He's called the Angel of the Lord. These are alphabetically listed here. The Anointed, Psalm 2. We're told the heathen uh, take uh, the nation's rage and said, let us uh, pit ourselves against the Lord and his anointed, the one who's anointed by God. The Apostle, he's called the Author. He's the Author and the Finisher of our faith. He's called the Alpha. That's the beginning and, of course, he's called the Omega also. The Babe, in Luke 2, uh, this list you can check out yourself. The Beginning of Creation, in Revelation 3. The Begotten of the Father, now, that means a unique relationship with the Father. He's called the Bishop, the Blessed, the Branch, the Brazen Serpent. Uh, Jesus led Nicodemus to Christ by using this title, he said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And he's called the bridegroom, and the church is the bride, of course. Revelation 22, he's referred to as the bright and morning star. Ephesians, Paul says he is the beloved. Joshua knows him as the captain of the Lord's host. He's called child in Isaiah 9. He's called the Christ in various passages. Uh, Simeon calls him the consolation of Israel. 
He's referred to as the cornerstone, the covenant, the counselor, the carpenter. Is not this the carpenter? The citizens of, of Nazareth wanted to know. He's called the commander, the day spring from on high, the day star, the deliverer, the desire of nations. Cuba desires Christ. She doesn't think she does, but she does. Russia, Albania, and other communistic nations desire the heart cry of the people is for Jesus. They don't know that. But he is the desire of all nations. And Jesus himself said he was the door of the sheepfold in John 10. He is called Emmanuel, meaning God with us. He's called the express image of God, the faithful witness, the father of eternity. That means he is the architect of the universe, the first fruits of the resurrection. He's called the foundation, the fountain, the forerunner. He's called the friend of sinners. The Pharisees called him that. Paul refers to him as the gift of God. Isaiah calls him the glory of God. Often he's simply called God. He's called the governor, the guide, the head of the church, the heir of all things, the high priest, the holy one of God. You know who called him that? It was the demon who called him that. The demons, the holy, I know who you are, thou holy one of God. He's called the holy one of Israel, the holy child, the horn of salvation. And then he referred to himself as the I am on seven occasions in the Gospel of John. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am the resurrection. I am the way. I am the true vine. He's called Jehovah, and he's called Jesus. Thou shalt call his name Jesus. That's his earthly name. He's called the judge. He's the king of Israel, the king of kings. John saw him coming as the king of kings. He's called, and the most important name is the Lamb of God. John 1, 29, that taketh away the sin of the world. He's called the, lie, the, the lawgiver, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lord of lords, the man. Behold the man. He's called the master, the mediator, the Messiah, the mighty God, the minister, the Nazarene. He's referred to as the only begotten of the Father, the Passover, Christ is our Passover, the potentate, that means supreme ruler, the prince, the prophet, he is our propitiation. That word propitiation means our satisfaction, as far as God is concerned. He's referred to the power of God, the purifier, the physician, the priest, the ransom, the reaper, the redeemer, the refiner, the refuge, referring to the cities of refuge, the righteousness, the Lord our righteousness. That's the name of the passage there that uh, Jeremiah gives him in Jeremiah 33. He's called the rock, the rod, the root of David, the rose of Sharon. He's called rabbi because he was a mighty teacher. He's called the sacrifice, the Samaritan. Uh, Luke 10, he had him himself in mind when he told the story of the good Samaritan. The seed of Abraham, the seed of David, the seed of the woman. He's called the second man, the servant, the shepherd. A number of times he's called that. John says he's the good shepherd. Paul says he's the great shepherd. Peter says he's the chief shepherd. And David summarizes by saying he's my shepherd. He's called Savior. The first person to call him Savior was his mother in Luke 1.47. But you know his favorite name for himself was the Son of Man. He only refers to himself as the Son of God on two occasions. He never pulled his rank, but he loved to call himself. He identified with man, the Son of Man. He said, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto. The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. The Son of Man alone can forgive sin. The Son of Man had not where to lay his head. The Son of Man, etc., 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 the Son of Man. And then he's called the Son of God. Even though Jesus did not refer to himself except on two occasions as the Son of God, Many in the Gospels called him this. Satan did in Matthew 4. Now, the King James would have us believe, perhaps, that uh, Satan doubted 
his deity when he said, if thou be the son of God. But in the Greek, that's literally, since you are the son of God. Whatever problem Satan has, he's not bothered with the problem of uh, atheism. Satan believes and he trembles. So he calls him, since you are the son of God. Uh, Gabriel the archangel called him the son of God in Mary's ears. The demons on two occasions refers to him as the son of God. And uh, Simon Peter did, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Martha did this. We believe that thou art the Christ, the son of God, which should come into the world. And others. The last person to call him that, to my knowledge, was a centurion, a Roman, who had helped crucify him, and then apparently was saved after the crucifixion. He said, surely this was the Son of God. He's called the Son of David, and he's called the Son of the Most High. He's referred to as Shiloh, that means peace, the Son of Mary, the Stone, the Son of Righteousness. He's called the Teacher, the Word. This is the Apostle John's favorite name for Christ. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and he's called Wonderful. We think of uh, that song about many songs, I should say, about the names of Jesus. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. And he's just the same as his lovely name. And that's the reason why I love him so for Jesus is the sweetest name I know. All right. Now, we've looked at his preexistence, his Old Testament ministry, his virgin birth incarnation, some of the biblical names. What about the humanity of Jesus Christ? Again, we can state he was as much man had he never been God. I'm not sure if you would have run into Jesus in a crowded marketplace or be seated next to him in a coffee shop uh, drinking coffee. You would have recognized him at first uh, as being anything except a man kindly, uh, just peaceful man, to be sure, a man that simply just sort of looked like he could be trusted, but I'm not sure you would have recognized anything different. Now, if he would talk to you, uh, or uh, if you would spend much time in his presence, obviously you would be uh, very much aware of the fact that this man does not speak like other men. He's different. But he looked like a man because he was a man. He... Uh, uh, he was, that is to say, he had the humanity that all men have. He had a human parentage, not human parents, but a human parentage. Uh, he had a human body. He speaks of that. Uh, he tells uh, the woman of Bethany, he says, she has anointed my body uh, for burial. And he had a soul. The scripture says he prayed on one occasion, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. And then he had a spirit. We're told that he rejoiced in the spirit on one occasion. Then another, so the last statement that he made, he dismissed his spirit. So he had a full human nature, body, soul, and spirit. Not only that, he looked like a man. Uh, the Samaritan woman just assumed he was another man. She said, how is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a Samaritan? And she thought at first he was just another man. And then to the Jews, uh, they said, well, you're just a man and you make yourself as God. Now, even after his resurrection, he was mistaken for a man. Mary felt him to be the gardener in John 20, and she spoke to him. She said, uh, the reason I'm weeping is because they have taken away the body of my Lord, and I, not, I know not where they have been, where they have laid him. But right before that, we read, she supposing him to be the gardener. He looked like a man because he did have the nature of a man. He possessed flesh and blood as men do. He grew. He asked questions. He increased in wisdom. He prayed. He was tempted. He was limited in his knowledge. The, the uh, human nature was, for example, in Mark 11, Mark 13, I should say, uh, Jesus was asked about the coming of the end of the world. He said, Of that day and of that hour knoweth no man, nor the angels in heaven, nor the Son. 
So the human nature did not was not responsive, or did uh, was not uh, in tune with that knowledge. Now, as God, He knew, but His human nature as man did not know. He was limited in knowledge. That's why he can increase in knowledge. He prayed. He was tempted. He learned obedience. And he hungered in his human nature. He thirsted. We're told he was weary. He slept. He loved. He had compassion. He was angered and grieved. All these are characteristics of a human person, human being. He experienced joy. He was troubled. He sweat drops of blood. He suffered. He bled. He died. And he was buried. He was as much man had he never been God. Now, the deity of Jesus Christ, he was as much God had he never been man. The Bible declares the deity of Christ. In the Old Testament, Psalm chapter 45, uh, David writes concerning a conversation here, and I'll turn to that, uh, Psalm 45, verse 6. Uh, existed that uh, conversation taking place between the Father and the Son. And the Father says, or the Son says, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. So in verse 7, Thou lovest righteousness and hatest wickedness. Therefore God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So David here claims that he is God. And then the witness of Isaiah. Again, we've talked about that. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. That's the word Elohim, the Mighty Elohim, the Creator. And then in Daniel 7, we have a description of the deity of Christ. He's known there as the Son of Man. But he's... Uh, described as being God himself. In the Gospels, we learn much about the deity of Christ. He is omnipotent. All power, he said, is given unto me. He's omnipotent over disease, demons, men, nature, sin, traditions, and death. When he calmed that wretched uh, horrible storm on the Sea of Galilee. They said, what manner of man is this? Well, this is the God-man that we are dealing with. He's not only omnipotent, but he is omniscient, as shown in the Gospels. He knew the whereabouts of Nathaniel. Philip went to get Nathaniel. If you remember, Nathaniel was seated under a tree, and uh, Jesus under a fig tree, and Jesus said, I saw you, when you were seated under that tree. Then he knew the plot of Judas. In John 6, he knew that Judas hated him, and he said, Have not I chosen you six, and one of you is a devil. So he knew the plot of Judas then, and he knew his plan to betray him later in John chapter 13. He knew the heart of the Pharisees. He was often talking to them about certain things, and he knew, he said, why say ye in your hearts? Because he knew that they were thinking evil thoughts about him. Then he knew the thoughts of the scribes, and he knew the problems of his disciples. On one occasion, they got in an argument when he wasn't around about who was the greatest in the kingdom, and they didn't want to tell him about it, but he knew what their hearts had been thinking. He knew the sincerity of one scribe. This scribe talked to him, and Jesus looked at him and said, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. He knew the sincerity that uh, had prompted those questions to Jesus. And then he knew the history of the Samaritan woman. He said, Go call your husband. He'd never seen her before, never heard about her. She said, I have no husband. He said, That's right, because the truth of the matter is you've had five, and the one you're living with now is not your real husband. So he is uh, omnipotent, and he is omniscient. Then he is omnipresent. Uh, certainly he is now on earth. He was limited to a body, and even though he has that body now, he is unlimited because the Scripture says that where two or more are gathered together in my name, Jesus says, there am I with you always. So he has all the attributes of deity. 
And then he is to be worshipped as deity, to be worshipped as God. In Hebrews 1, verse 6, we're told that, that when he bringeth his first into the world, that he called upon the angels to worship this one. Uh, he was worshipped by the shepherds, by the wise men, by a leper, by a ruler. He was worshipped by a Syrophoenician woman, by a mother, by a maniac, by a man born, born blind, by Thomas, by some Greeks, and by his apostles. And the amazing thing here is that our Lord never, on one occasion here of the many that I've given you, rebuked anyone for worshiping him. Had he not been God, he would have been guilty of terrible blasphemy. For uh, God says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and, and you're not to love any other gods. I want sole place in your heart. I want you to worship me and me only. And uh, here Jesus accepts the worship of believers. So he, he is either God and deserves these uh, worship hours, or he is an imposter and he's not God at all. He forgives sin. No priest, no preacher, no rabbi, no apostle could ever forgive sin. But our Savior says, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Only God can do that, not a priest. He judges. The Bible says, in fact, our Lord said himself in John 5, that someday all judgment would be given over to the Son. So here we speak of the judgment seat of Christ, where Christ will judge us. But what about the great white throne judgment? The same gentle Jesus that once said, Allow the little children to come into me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God, will someday, behind the great white throne judgment, say to all unsaved, Depart from me, ye cursed, for I never knew you into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then Jesus saves. And not Toyota or Datsum or some of these other cars on television, but Jesus saves. Only God can save. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So in the Gospel account... We have the earmarks of deity. And then in the book of Acts, the testimony of Stephen. Stephen saw Jesus stand upon the right hand of God. And the testimony of a, of, of a, a eunuch, Ethiopian eunuch. He was led to Christ by Philip. And Philip says, would you like to be baptized? He said, yes. Uh, I would. He said, and Philip said, then let's hear your testimony. He said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he's referred to, his deity is referred to by the book of Acts. And then in the epistles, in Paul, Peter, Jude, James, John, all the authors of the New Testament speak of the deity of Christ. And if you can read the Word of God, even in a cursory way, a very casual manner, and not glean this truth from it, that Jesus was God, then number one, you're not saved, or secondly, you're demon-possessed, or thirdly, you're unbelievably naive, and you just can't put two and two together. All right, now, what about the impeccability of the Lord Jesus Christ? Uh, we've looked at a number of other things about his person, about his work, what does it mean to be impeccable? It means the inability to do something, and in this case, the inability to sin. Now, this subject that we're going to deal with now talks about sinlessness. And here we would like to state two facts. Number one, Christ did not sin. And secondly, Christ could not sin. Christ did not sin. We're informed that he knew no sin, he did no sin, and in him was no sin. He told the disciples in John 14, the prince of this world hath nothing in me. He has a lot in me. He has uh, uh, doorknobs to hang on to, and he has a place on occasion to hang his hat, as it were, 
but Jesus said, The devil cannot find a toehold concerning my entire being. He hath nothing in me or on me. But the facts concerning the sinlessness of Christ while he was upon this earth are well attested. In fact, sometimes by many individuals, some of which were his enemies. For example, Pilate uh, remarks concerning the faultlessness of Christ in John chapter 19. He says, I find no fault in him. And then Pilate's wife also uh, felt the same thing. She had a very disturbing dream. And she says, husband, have nothing to do with the uh, blood or the life of this innocent man, for I have dreamed many things about him. Uh, Judas, who betrayed him, admits to his sinlessness. He said, I have betrayed innocent blood. And then the dying thief, of course, realizes that here another dying person can save him. He realizes his innocence. He says to the other thief, and at first both thieves were cursing Jesus, and then the one said, hey, don't curse him. I was wrong to do so, and you don't do that either, because uh, we are dying, rightly so, for our sins, but this man hath done nothing. And then the Roman centurion uh, realized his deity and his sinlessness when he cries out that truly this was the, the Son of God, this, this righteous man. Now, I said that that we, I'm looking at my man now to find out exactly how much time we have left. And this is the second lecture. All right. Uh, the second statement is this. The first was Christ did not sin, and there's no argument there among Bible believers. But amazingly, uh, there are some uh, disagreements concerning uh, the second part of the statement. Christ not only did not sin, but he could not sin. I don't think there's a question, as I said before, the fact that Jesus did not sin on this earth, but could he have sinned? We'd like to quote from an author, W.E. Best, who has written a helpful book on the ministry of Christ entitled Studies in the Person and Work of Jesus Christ. Best says, there is no question, Best says, I'm sorry here, the point of view that Christ could sin is designated by the idea of peccability, and the fact that he could not sin is expressed by the term impeccability. To suggest the capability or possibility of sinning would disqualify Christ as Savior, for a peccable Christ would mean a peccable God. Holiness is far more than the absence of sin, and Jesus was holy, of course. It is positive virtue. The advocates of peccability say Christ could have sinned, but he did not. Well, to say that he could have sinned is to deny positive holiness. To deny positive holiness, therefore, is to deny the holy character of God. Holiness is positive virtue, which has neither room for nor interest in sin. The Lord Jesus could not sin because the days of his flesh meant only addition of experience, not variation of character. Holy humanity was united to deity in one indivisible person, the impeccable Christ. Jesus Christ cannot have more holiness because he is perfectly holy. He cannot have less holiness because he is unchangingly holy. In other words, if Christ could have sinned, uh, then this would have meant that he might have done so. He didn't, but he might have done so. And if he had done so, there's always a possibility that he could, if you believe in the peccability uh, aspect of this, then he would not have been God, or let's put it this way, he would have ceased from being God. And the Bible says that God cannot sin. And so you, here you have a contradiction in terms. He could not, let alone did not, sin. Of course, the question is asked that if Christ could not sin, what then was the purpose of the temptation in the wilderness? 
And here I think it should be observed that the trials there were not to see if Christ would sin, but to prove he would not or could not. I've already suggested this in our Life of Christ study, but it is possible for a tiny chihuahua dog to attack a huge lion. But it is totally impossible for the little creature to conquer the big cat. It can attack it, but it can't whip it. Or a, a rowboat might declare war on a mighty nuclear-equipped battleship, but it could never sink that battleship. An unconquerable army might be attacked, but it would never be defeated. Now, Roman numeral 8, the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. It has been rightly said that the first three gospel accounts of the four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, offer the presentation of Christ's earthly ministry, while the fourth account, the Gospel of John, gives us the interpretation of that life. And the following is a brief outline of the more important or most important events in his life down here. Usually in the study of the doctrine of Christ, the Bible student will zero in on at least some type of harmony of the Gospels, what he did down here. Now, I'm not giving you a harmony of the Gospels because you have already had this or will have it if you don't already in the basic stages in the Book of Ages New Testament uh, on the four gospel story, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And I feel it not good or necessary to go back and plow up that ground again. But in order to summarize his life, consider these 48 events, and uh, we probably won't get through them uh, on this tape here. His birth certainly should be included the incarnation, these 48 events, and then his circumcision at the age of eight days, and then his trip to Egypt as a boy, perhaps of one and a half to two years of age, his early life in Nazareth, where he grew and increased in knowledge and wisdom and in favor with God and man, the next uh, 30 years of his life, the visit to the temple when he was 12, that is an important study, and then his baptism at the age of about 30, his temptation shortly after that, his first miracle of 35 or 36 in Cana of Galilee, where he changes water into wine, and then the first temple cleansing at Jerusalem, which uh, transpired shortly after his first miracle, his conversion with Nicodemus, so important, his conversion with a Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, his sermon on Isaiah 61 in the city of Nazareth, and the choosing of the twelve in Matthew 10. These are events that are very important. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. The parable of the sower in Matthew 13, the longest parable that he taught. The feeding of the 5,000, one of the two miracles that appear in all four gospel accounts. Walking on the water, and forgiving an adulterous woman in John chapter 8, healing a man born blind, John gives an entire chapter over to this, chapter 9, sermons on the, uh, his sermon on the Good Shepherd, John 10, I am the Good Shepherd, the Good Shepherd giveth his life for the sheep, and then hearing Peter's great confession at Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God, his glorious transformation or transfiguration in Matthew 17, and then the parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, one of his most well-known parables, the parable of the rich fool in Luke 12, the parable of the prodigal son in verse Luke 15, the account of Lazarus and the rich man in Luke 16, the raising of Lazarus from the dead in John 11, and then speaking to the rich young ruler, Matthew 19, the conversion of wee little Zacchaeus in Luke 19, the anointing of Mary of Bethany against his burial in John 12, his triumphal entry, Matthew 21, the cursing of the fig tree, the setting apart of Israel, John or Matthew 21, 
indicting Israel's leaders, Matthew 23, his tears over Jerusalem, Luke 19, Matthew 23, his Mount Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, 25, the Last Supper in the Upper Room, John 13 and 14, his Sermon on Fruit Bearing, John 15, his Great High Priestly Prayer, John 17, Gethsemane, John 18, the Trial and uh, and Condemnation by Pilate, John 19, his Crucifixion, John 19, the Conversion of the Dying Thief, Luke 23, His glorious resurrection, Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20. His appearance to Mary Magdalene in John 20. His appearance on the Emmaus Road in John 20, or Luke 24. His restoration of Simon Peter uh, by the Sea of Galilee in John 21. And then his ascension in Luke 24. I think I left one out. He's appearing to his disciples in Luke 23. So of the five or six hundred events in the life of Christ, I have taken these 48 and placed here for your considered study. At this point, we'll end the second lecture.